A Patriot's History of the United States, Chapter 15, Part 5. Bulls and Bulls. Prohibition's social sideshow had little effect on the continued technological advances of the 20s and their spillover effect on the stock market and the American economy. Improved productivity in the brokerage and investment firms expanded their ability to provide capital for the growing number of auto factories, glassworks, cement plants, tire manufacturers, and dozens of other complementary enterprises. Moreover, both traditional manufacturing and the new industries of radio, movies, finance, and telephones all required electricity. With electric power applied as never before, the utilities industries also witnessed a boom. In 1899, for example, electrical motors accounted for only 5% of all the installed horsepower in the United States. But 30 years later, electrical power accounted for 80% of the installed horsepower. One estimate found that electricity could increase the productivity on a given task by two-thirds. Productivity per factory man-hour rose by an astonishing 75% from 1922 to 1928. That automobile electrical nexus probably would have sustained the great bull market by itself, but added to it were several other unrelated industries, including radio broadcasters who reached 7.5 million sets by 1928. Radio broadcasting stood uniquely among all industries in that it depended entirely on advertising for its sustenance. Advertising revenues on radio had accounted for $350 million by the middle of the decade, reflecting the growing power of Madison Avenue and professional advertising. For the first time, advertising and professional marketing entered the mainstream of American society, shucking the aura of hucksterism associated with P.T. Barnum. All this growth, energy, and American industrial success alarmed the Europeans. In 1927, at the International Economic Conference in Geneva, which met at the behest of the French, proposals were put forward for an economic League of Nations, whose long-term goal is the creation of a United States of Europe. This was according to the chairman, the sole economic formula which can effectively fight against the United States of America. English writer J.B. Priestley complained a few years later that British roads only differ in a few minor details from a few thousand such roads in the United States, where the same toothpastes and soaps and gramophone records are being sold, the very same films are being shown here. Europeans seemed uniformly wary of the rising American economic might with books such as America Coming of Age, 1927, warning of the rising giant across the Atlantic. We should not discount these reactions because they underscore the fact that the U.S. economy was robust and reinforced evidence that the stock market boom was not an illusion. Rather than a frenzy of speculation, the great bull market reflected the fantastic growth in genuine production, which did not fall. Consequently, stocks did not fall either. Using an index of common stock prices for the year 1900 equaling 100, the index topped 130 in 1922, 140 in 1924, 320 in 1928, and 423 in October 1929. Individual stocks refused to go down. Radio Corporation of America, RCA, never paid a single dividend, yet its stock went from $85 a share to 289 in 1928 alone. General Motors stock that was worth $25,000 in 1921 was valued at $1 million in 1929. Was that all speculation? It is doubtful. GM produced $200 million in profits in 1929 alone. Samuel Insull's massive electric network, which consistently lowered prices for consumers, only seemed to expand. 
who did not want electricity. In virtually all cases, radios, cars, electricity, banking, corporate giants such as Ford and David Sarnoff, Insul and AP Giannani democratized products by lowering prices by several orders of magnitude. Almost every walk of life saw some American, many of them recent immigrants, come up with a new product that pushed prices down and convenience up. Leo Becklund, a Belgian chemist who came to the United States in the late 1800s, worked for Eastman Photography, where he helped develop a revolutionary photography paper, then used the small fortune he got from the sale of that product to create one of the first commercial plastics in America, Bakelite. Instantly, manufacturers substituted plastics, which they could easily mold, for door handles, gear shift knobs, radiator caps, and myriad other parts. And Bakelite, like so many other products, further forced down prices for ordinary Americans. Moreover, new research of patentable assets suggested that the 1920s was a remarkable era for the rise of knowledge capital. Innovation was a significant driver of stock market value, and the crash did not reflect a significant revaluation of knowledge capital relative to physical capital. Certainly, the securities firms gave the market a push whenever possible, mostly through margin sales in which an individual could put down as little as 10% early in the decade to purchase stock, using the stock itself as collateral for the 90% borrowed from the broker. By mid-decade, most firms had raised their margins to 15%, yet margin buying continued to accelerate, going from $1 billion in 1921 to $8 billion in 1929. But it wasn't only the rich investing in the market. In 1900, 15% of American families owned stock. By 1929, 28% of American families held stock. One analysis of those buying at least 50 shares of stock in large utility issue showed that the most numerous purchasers in order were housekeepers, clerks, factory workers, merchants, chauffeurs and drivers, electricians, mechanics, and foremen. In other words, hardly the wealthy speculators that critics in the 20s would suggest. The fact that many Americans were better off than they had ever been before deeply disturbed some partly because the middle class was rapidly closing in on the money delete. Writers like F. Scott Fitzgerald sneered that Americans had engaged in the greatest, gaudiest spree in history. Others employing religious models viewed the prosperity of the 1920s as a materialist binge that required a disciplinary correction. But the facts of the consumer durables revolution reflected both the width and depth of the wealth explosion. By 1928, American homes had 15 million irons, 6.8 million vacuum cleaners, 5 million washers, 4.5 million toasters, and 750,000 electric refrigerators. Housing construction reached record levels beginning in 1920, when the United States embarked on the longest building boom in history. By the middle of the decade, more than 11 million families had acquired homes, three-fourths of which had electrical power by 1930. During the 1920s, total electrical product sales had increased to $2.4 billion. Per capita income had increased from $522 to $716 between 1921 and 1929 in real terms. And such a rising tide of affluence allowed people to save and invest as never before, acquiring such instruments of savings as life insurance policies. Indeed, the notion first offered by John Maynard Keynes in his General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, 1936, and later championed by John Kenneth Galbraith in The Great Crash, 1955, that consumer purchasing fell behind the productivity increases, causing a glut of goods late in the decade doesn't wash. In 1921, the consumer share of GNP was $54 billion, and it quickly rose to $73 billion, adding 5% at a time when consumer prices were falling. 
It gave consumers the available cash to own not only stocks and bonds, but also to control five-sixths of the world's production of autos, one car for every five people in America, and allowed a growing number of people to engage and travel by air. In 1920, there were only 40,000 air passengers. By 1930, the number had leaped to 417,000, and it shot up again to 3.1 million by 1940. It is essential to understand the intellectual stake the modern left has in debunking the real growth of the 1920s to set the stage for its speculation theories. Only if the phenomenal growth and wealth of the 1920s can be explained away in terms of greedy mania can the unprecedented intervention of government in the 1930s be even partially justified. But such was not the case. Although the soaring level of investment in securities and the business boom fostered the legend that both Harding and Coolidge were rabid pro-business types, attackers have especially and selectively repeated Coolidge's comment that the business of America is business and his suggestion that the man who builds a factory builds a temple. What did Coolidge really say about business? We live in an age of abounding accumulation of material things. These did not create our declaration. Our declaration created them. The things of the spirit come first. Criticized by historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr., who served as the court historian for Franklin Roosevelt and John Kennedy as wanting a business government, Coolidge, in fact, said that America needed a government that will understand business. I meant a government able to establish the best possible relations between the people in their business capacity and the people in their social capacity. Silent Cal had a few weaknesses, including his intolerance for the insubordinate but ultimately accurate predictions of Colonel Billy Mitchell and his support of tariffs. Overall, though, it was Coolidge's moral compass and self-control over executive power that allowed the bulls to dominate Wall Street. Contributing to the great bull market, however, were successful foreign policies that also helped usher in a decade of peace that contributed to the prosperity. And we'll read a tornado of cheering in the next video. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.